To publish a book entitled The Man Behind the Curtain, Michael Voris and the Homosexual Vortex, might have seemed like an odd thing for Dr. E. Michael Jones to do in 2016. But upon retrospect, given the public behavior of the book's subject these last intervening years, the wisdom of contemporaneously documenting the behind-the-scenes drama at Church Militant is thus apparent. Given the blistering attacks the alleged traditionalists at Voris's suburban Detroit headquarters have unleashed on basically every other traditionalist, including Dr. Taylor Marshall, Dr. Brian McCall, Michael Matt, Matt Gaspers, John Henry Weston, LifeSite News, The Remnant, Catholic Family News, and others, not to mention Bishop Fillet, the SSPX, and Father James Jackson, FSSP, a study into the motivation of the man behind the endless barrage of blue-on-blue events sheds light not only on precisely why they keep happening, but what's really going on. The Man Behind the Curtain, which is self-published by Dr. Jones, contains well-evidenced, contemporaneous, written accounts of the entire saga of Church Militant, from its shaky foundations to the near-constant concealment of its various dark secrets, and the dramatic month of April 2016 culminating in the public reinvention of Michael Voris as the victim of his own homosexual past. In preparing a book review, I realized that my words would invariably fall short of accurately describing the riveting detail and page-turning drama the author achieves. Instead, I'd like to present you merely with a reading from one of the many interesting chapters. You're about to hear about investor fraud, tax fraud, self-enrichment and other thievery, as well as a timeline of when, where, and how various stakeholders, board members, and benefactors learned of long-concealed pasts, HIV positivity, disordered weddings at sea, reenacted annually in a supposedly Catholic concept, and worse. This podcast is not for children. As a reminder, the book is available and back in print for a limited time at fidelitypress.org for $15. There are a number of copies available, so you'll want to pick yours up. Click the link in the description to support Dr. E. Michael Jones's important work. And now for a preview from the sixth chapter of The Man Behind the Curtain. Chapter 6. Church Militant. The History Leading to the Crisis. Boris became involved with his spiritual advisor during the fall of 2010, shortly after the vortex on homosexuals as victim souls had appeared. Boris was looking for a chaplain who would say both the Novus Ordo and extraordinary forms of the Mass. By that time, Boris had already done a piece on the Novus Ordo Mass entitled Weapons of Mass Destruction. His spiritual advisor, for his part, was intrigued by the prospects which the new media i.e. Internet TV, offered. But he was also having troubles of his own. He was being victimized by a powerful gay priest in his diocese, and so took the opportunity to visit Michael at his studio, where he was taken aback by how brash Voris was. Over time, the two developed a kind of synchronicity on what was happening in the church. Voris was initially kind and welcoming, but he soon began to act out the sadistic hostility, the continuous sarcasm, and the contemptuous humor that characterized the gay lifestyle. Cut off from diocesan funds, his spiritual director accepted the abuse. As a result, a form of paralysis set in. Because no one wanted to imply that Voris was condemned by his past, everyone tried to convince themselves that Voris was doing good for the church, in spite of the fact that good priests were now saying that he was doing harm to the church. Captured by a combination of financial dependence and bad theology, his spiritual advisor didn't know what to say and feared that he was guilty of abetting the harm Voris was doing. In late 2010, or early 2011, Voris began to get some inkling of the negative impression he was creating in the church, when he was banned from speaking at World Youth Day in Madrid through the behind-the-scenes machinations of Father Thomas Rosica, 
a Canadian priest who was involved in the preparations for Madrid because he was on the Pontifical Council for the laity. At around the same time, he denied Voris an opportunity to speak to young people at the Madrid conference. Razica orchestrated a Catholic news service story that claimed that Church Militant had failed to file its state tax returns and that Church Militant staff member Simon Raff had been involved in posting a homoerotic fanzine on his blog. The story was humiliating and embarrassing. Boris learned that Rosica was behind it because Rosica wrote to a blogger, Your idol has fallen. As another sign that trouble was looming just over the horizon, Boris refused to take Mark Bramer's counsel and fire Simon Raff, who was demoted off-camera but kept on the staff. Bramer first met Michael Voris in May 2008, when Voris agreed to a speaking engagement at a father and son gathering that Bramer organized at the Winmore Center near Notre Dame. The topic was the role of Catholic media today and how the internet could be a distribution game changer in the years to come. At this time, Voris was creating a video program at his studio in Detroit called The One True Faith which would be broadcast from time to time on television stations that were owned by various dioceses across the United States. The problem, as Voris explained it to Bramer, was that often the staff who operated these stations would receive communications from the Chancery Office of the Archdiocese of Detroit to the effect that there was no support for Voris's work by the Detroit Archdiocese. This naturally created concern at the television stations and the easy response was to deny Voris airtime and thus eliminate any future risk of conflict with Detroit. The future did not look good for the one true faith, or for Voris and his St. Michael's media staff in Detroit. According to Voris, the way around this bleak scenario was to create an internet distribution strategy for access and viewing via a web-enabled website with a mixture of free programs as well as for-a-fee premium content. This avoided any dependency on other television stations. Boris made it clear to Bramer that he was running out of money and could not fund an internet TV station venture. So Bramer made the decision to fund the startup venture with a commitment of $250,000, which would launch the for-profit operation in 2008 doing business as RealCatholicTV.com, the name Boris preferred. Boris was not an equity owner in RCTV. RCTV was owned 100% by Bramer. Because Bramer lived in South Bend, Indiana, under the jurisdiction of Bishop Kevin Rhodes, he technically had to apply for permission to use the term Catholic in the title of his operation. I say technically because the issue had already been decided years before when the National Catholic Reporter defied the U.S. Bishop's attempt to get them to remove the name Catholic. Bramer wanted an accommodation with the bishop. The fact that Voris did not go down the National Catholic Reporter route is a sign that Bramer was in charge of the operation. As president of Concept Communications, doing business as Concept Productions, Voris signed an internet video content production agreement with Bramer on August 25, 2008, to produce programming for RCTV distribution and subscriptions. After Voris formalized his agreement with Bramer, all revenue and expense reimbursements were processed through the bank account of RCTV in South Bend, Indiana, the home office of the venture. At no time was the not-for-profit St. Michael's Media in Detroit a party to any operating agreement with Bramer. St. Michael's Media remained completely separate from RCTV operations. In 2012, Bishop Vigneron of Detroit began to press Voris to remove Catholic from the title of his organization, and a jurisdictional dispute followed between the Diocese of South Bend, where Bramer lived, and Detroit, where the RCTV studios were located. Voris at this point insisted that the issue had to be resolved in South Bend because Bramer was the owner of RCTV. As a result, Bramer met with Bishop Kevin Rhodes, ordinary of the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend, and both concluded that a name change was the best way forward. 
After Bramer agreed, Bishop Rhodes offered a suitable window of time to make the change. In an episode of The Vortex coinciding with a June 12, 2012 move to a new studio building, Boris announced that the digital television company would be switching to a new name with a new website, churchmilitant.tv. Legally, nothing changed between Voris and Bramer. But suddenly, all subscription revenue stopped being processed through Bramer's bank account in South Bend. No agreements were executed to memorialize this change. Quote, it just happened, Bramer said. In February 2012, Voris' spiritual director discovered that Voris had a past that included sexual activity with both men and women and that he was HIV positive. The fact that Voris had been a homosexual and was now engaged in public denunciation of clergy and bishops for the very sins he himself had committed turned real Catholic TV into a bombshell that could go off at any moment. Voris remained oblivious to the danger, saying in typically narcissistic fashion that God would never let this come about. He continued in the same vein by claiming that he, as the prodigal son, had a right to talk about sodomy. If anyone had that right, it was Voris. Pressure was building, both inside and outside RCTV. By the end of 2012, Voris was in a precarious situation because a gay priest had tar- he had targeted was demanding financial statements. The infallible sign that a, quote, apostolate has become a racket is the benefactor Cruz. Church Militant TV was no exception to this rule. On April 2, 2016, Voris and his benefactors set sail on Church Militant's fourth annual Retreat at Sea, a cruise along the coast of California which included, quote, 13 exclusive conferences given by Michael Voris on topics like crisis in the church and purity, as well as daily mass and Eucharistic adoration, all followed by meals prepared by the Ruby Princess chefs, who are, quote, true culinary artists, who make each meal an unforgettable gourmet experience. There was more than a little irony involved in the cruise. As Maureen Malarkey later put it, quote, your best hope is to pay up for his luxury Lenten cruise at the foot of the cross on the Ruby Princess, daiquiri in hand and seagulls overhead. Beyond the obvious cognitive dissidence, which meditation on the cross of Christ caused when linked to unforgettable gourmet meals, there was the added irony involved in the fact that Voris was a frequent habitué of gay cruises during his years as an active homosexual. The fact that Voris kept photo albums of those cruises, which included photos of his quote-unquote marriage ceremony to the man who made him HIV positive, was some indication that he had more than a lingering attachment to his former life. The Retreat at Sea cruise was just one more indication that Voris was acting out a spiritual version of the same life he had lived as a homosexual. There were other indications that he wanted to hold on to his past life while still clinging to the belief that he was leading a new, more spiritual life. In addition to being narcissistic, Voris was obsessive-compulsive and had filing cabinets full of receipts from every gay spa and restaurant he had ever frequented which indicated more attachment to his former life, as well as the fact that he trivialized the degree of sin that he had been involved in. Boris's homosexuality was not an isolated incident. It was a public commitment, as symbolized by his quote-unquote marriage ceremony at sea that continued for years. The fact that he had broken with former sex partners was not a sign that he had broken with his past, but was simply typical of the homosexual scene, where relationships don't last. You simply have sex and move on. Gay culture is completely narcissistic. Once a homosexual has sex, he has no more use for a sex partner. He cuts them off, and they are dead to him. Boris followed this pattern. There was no communication between him and his old lovers. Once he had a desire to reconnect with Chris Newsom, who is the man he would have married in the surreal world of homosexual relationships, Boris couldn't find him on Facebook but he kept looking and eventually discovered that this young man had been killed in a plane crash. He and his new lover had been flying over the Upper Peninsula when their plane went down. After the crash, Newsom got out of the plane, 
walked 60 feet, and then died of his injuries. This was very traumatic, but it was part of a pattern. As another example of the same attachment, Voris decorated his house with pictures of Disney cartoons, which he had gotten from his former boyfriend. When Voris was urged to remove them because they were a sign of his attachment to his former life, he refused and finally invoked his mother, who had liked those pieces, as the reason why they should stay. The clientele on the retreat at sea cruise was typical of fag-hag culture. It was made up of young men who idolized Voris and women who wanted to mother him. This time, however, things did not go according to plan. Instead of the adulation he was used to on such occasions, Voris's supporters seemed concerned about his health. Voris looked ill. He had lost weight. The faithful were wondering if something was wrong. Was Michael sick? Voris had been under severe psychological pressure for some time. As of November 2015, premium subscriber renewals had declined dramatically, increasing the financial strain on St. Michael's media. Boris's body reacted to the pressure by coming down with a case of shingles. His mind reacted by deciding to up the ante. The Dolan Has to Go program came out in December 2015. As of early 2016, Boris was planning to hire a private detective to follow Cardinal Whirl around and photograph him driving to the apartment of his gay lover. When his spiritual director responded by saying, What about your photos, Michael? Don't people have a right to know about your past? Boris was furious because, in the role he had created for himself as super macho church reformer, he felt that he had his moral authority to shame bishops. At around the same time that Voris was sailing up and down the coast of California lecturing the faithful on purity, Mark Bramer got a call from Mark DeYoung, a seminarian at Dunwoody, the same seminary which Voris had attended for two years during the 80s. The current crop of seminarians at Dunwoody were avid Voris fans, but they were being told that Voris had been dismissed for a good reason and didn't know who to believe. DeYoung had told Bramer during one of his trips to New York that the seminary officials were willing to release Voris's dossier to the public if Voris felt the rumors were false. Voris had always maintained that he had not been dismissed because of homosexual activity, but because of his spiritual immaturity, failing to understand that spiritual immaturity had become a code word for homosexuality. Unaware of that point, Voris has made some efforts to prove that he was not kicked out because of the gay lifestyle. On April 10th, one day after the Ruby Princess retreat at sea had docked in Los Angeles, Bramer met with Voris's spiritual director, who then told him what he knew about Voris's homosexual past. At this point, the dam broke. Both men now felt that Church Militant TV could not go forward with Voris as its director, and the two decided to join with a number of stakeholders at CMTV and come up with a plan that would allow Voris to go quietly to avoid scandal. The current stakeholders at Church Militant approached Bramer because he was, on paper at least, still the owner of what had once been Real Catholic TV. Since there had been no formal transition from Real Catholic to Church Militant, the original agreement still applied. Voris was not an equity owner of RCTV. Voris owned the assets of Concept Productions, a for-profit corporation. Bramer had been dealing with Concept Productions without knowing that Voris had founded it with one of his homosexual friends, John Mola. Voris ran Concept, a for-profit entity, under an operating agreement with Bramer that allowed him to produce the media content which got broadcast on RCTV. Bramer's plan to remove Voris was consistent with church tradition on the handling of public scandal for church officials in the public eye. Marcel Maciel, head of the Legionnaires of Christ, retired to a monastery after the scandals concerning his sexual activity broke. After Rembert Weekland resigned in disgrace as the head of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, after paying one of his homosexual lovers over $100,000 in hush money, he was asked to retire to a monastery. Not only has he not complied, he has gone on to become a crusader for homosexual rights, portraying himself as a martyr to that cause. Weakland's response was typically narcissistic. Consumed with self-pity, Weakland proposed himself as a martyr for the noble cause of sodomy. 
In doing so, he placed himself once again at the center of the universe, a position he had been occupying for some time because of the narcissism that is always the hidden grammar of homosexuality. Boris's response was not typical, but it was narcissistic nonetheless. Boris's repeated condemnation of homosexual activity conformed to the opinion of the vast majority of people who still think homosexuality is abnormal, in spite of the prolonged bombardment of normality propaganda by the ignorant and slavishly trendy social and political ideologists who rule the media public and a great part of the academic world. It was narcissistic in his own way because it positioned Voris at the center of the universe every bit as much as Rembert Weekland and every other homosexual activist did. Quote, We realized that Church Militant had died that night, Bramer said of his conversation on April 10th with Voris' spiritual director. Bramer then called Voris on the phone and related the conversation he had with Mark DeYoung. He then asked Voris, Is there a gay past? And after some hemming and hawing, Voris finally admitted that there was. Bramer then concluded that in order to salvage what was left of Church Militant, we have to find a way to move him off the scene. This meant that he should not come out. Boris could explain things to his staff, but under no circumstances should he do a vortex. Instead, he should go away quietly, claiming that he was retiring for health reasons, which was true, so that the good he had done could be preserved. What followed were protracted, long-distance negotiations over repurposing church militant into something less toxic than what it had become. On April 10th, Bramer wrote an email explaining that, quote, Boris called me last night and we spent an hour talking about everything. I reminded him that any and all of my help needs full disclosure to the staff and benefactors, and that the only way I can help launch a new company requires his departure completely. I promise to take care of him financially and whatever he chooses as as way to repurpose his years ahead. There was every indication that he seemed willing to discuss this scenario with his staff as part of the full disclosure before my return to South Bend by Friday. Either way, I demanded a decision by him on Friday as to whether my proposal is acceptable. I either go away or start to dig. We shall know soon what he and the staff decide. All of you can decide what to do on your own to help between now and Friday. All my best to everyone affected by this decision. Mother Angelica, pray for us. On Wednesday, April 13th, an email texting correspondence ensued. Bramer insisted that Voris resign, and Carol agreed the church militant was over. Perhaps because Carol sided with Bramer, Voris seemed open to the idea of going quietly. On Friday, April 15th, Ryan Walker, one of Voris's backers and, more importantly, the only person Voris could consider a friend, drove from Detroit to South Bend, Indiana to attend the Notre Dame Blue Gold game with two of his sons. His original plan involved bringing Voris and Matthew Pearson, Voris's assistant, to South Bend to confer with Bramer and E. Michael Jones about future programming. During the same conversation in which Bramer confronted Voris over his homosexual past, Bramer told Voris that it would be better if he did not come to South Bend and that he was not welcome to stay at his house. On the evening of Saturday, April 16th, after dinner at Tepecano Place in South Bend, Bramer told the entire story to a shocked Ryan Walker. Walker had invited Voris to Colorado to be godfather to one of his seven children. Bramer then told Walker that he needed to confront Voris the following day when he returned to Detroit. Boris had to tell the staff what was going on or Bramer would tell the staff. He had to go quietly. On April 16th, Boris wrote, As of next Friday, I will not be a public personality, how I dislike that term, any longer. I will have passed the baton to the team, will have done so very publicly, given them every vote of confidence I can, and ask the supporters to do the same. End quote. On April 16th, the ironic 
if resigned nature of the email correspondence changed dramatically when Frank Cohen disagreed with Voris's description of how St. Michael's Media was run and how it related to Concept, the for-profit corporation which Voris had founded before his conversion. According to Cohn, Voris's admission that he had transferred assets from the not-for-profit St. Michael's Media to his for-profit corporation, Concept, meant that, quote, Michael has designed and perpetuated a fraud. The report does not list his receiving any compensation involved with a related vendor, provider of services, or the name of concept anywhere. The entire 990 presents that SMM has 426,559 in salaried employees. Also, SMM has ownership of more than 1.2 million of real estate and equipment. By federal law, the report has to be a true and accurate presentation of SMM. According to this email, it is not even close. Is there anything else to say on the plus side of the ledger for MV? End quote. In a previous email, Voris had admitted that, quote, SMM does have its own stuff, buildings and a little bit of equipment. But the overwhelming ownership is by Concept, which has total control over CM. Concept carries the majority of the payroll, equipment, programming, etc. It is true in the earlier years the apostolate was almost exclusively an SMM financial endeavor. But with the emergence of RC slash CM over the past eight years, that has shifted considerably for a variety of reasons. I understand, of course, not being involved in the nitty-gritty of all this during the years, but this would not be readily apparent to you. Why would it be? But the reality is that SMM is by far the secondary player here, and I'm not sure what changes in that arena would accomplish substantially. Cohn's revelation changed the whole tenor of the conversation about Voris's exit and the repurposing of St. Michael's media. Terry Carroll was stunned by Cohn's charges. Quote, I had no idea about the legal implications of his 990, he wrote. That's just not my thing. I'm not comfortable thinking of Michael as a criminal, except in the technical sense that when you violate the law, you do something criminal. Carroll then began making excuses for Voris. Quote, I think he is in over his head with the intricate bookkeeping necessary to keep separate the not- profit, and the for-profit sides of his complicated enterprise. From emails I have seen that he has written to others, I think he really does care about his people as if they are family and for whom he feels personally responsible. I think that is very much clouding his business judgment, as we all know can happen. End quote. Bramer, who had invested 250000 in what he thought was a 50-50 partnership with Voris that originated with RCTV, was now convinced that Voris had taken advantage of his goodwill and had accepted his investment under false pretenses by concealing his homosexuality. Bramer later claimed that he never would have made such an investment if he had known the truth about Voris's past. Voris was now guilty of both homosexuality and fraud, in Bramer's eyes, and Bramer felt that this demanded some sort of restitution. At 4.33 p.m. on April 16th, Bramer wrote back to Frank Cohn and described the whole scenario as, quote, a nightmare, double whammy, bad past and bad present, especially the business side of things. He absolutely is guilty of criminal fraud given his depiction of concepts and SMM. I am shocked he admitted to this in an email. Now I even feel more thankful that I didn't participate in a restructuring of an illegal media structure. This is going down quickly. End quote. Cohn replied by saying that what he had learned from examining St. Michael's Media's 990 forms, quote, just confirms my statement four years ago that he is a crook. Also, why I recommended that everything move out of SMM as quickly as possible. Hope that IRS does not audit this snake pit. He will be back in debt to them as he was for the first four years of RCTV. End quote. As of the morning of Saturday, April 16th, Voris had come around to Bramer's point of view. 
He told Simon Rath that he had agreed to go off camera and work behind the scenes. He was pensive. He was in a defeated state and felt that something drastic had to happen. And once Cohn brought up the issue of fraud, the tenor of the conversation began to change. Boris started backing away from the agreement to go quietly. He was now saying that he was going to resign, but not retire, meaning that he was going to run the operation from behind the scenes. Bremer replied that this was not acceptable. He had to go away completely. Bremer was now starting to lose patience with Voris. Later on the same day, Bremer told Carol, quote, If NYC gets wind of this, Michael better be prepared to lawyer up. Sorry to even suggest this, but... Terry, my good man, if you honestly believe that a takeover is in the best interest of lots of people, including Michael, you need to seriously think about such a scenario. Michael would have no choice but an orderly transition if he knows he faces legal action. I am going to put you on the spot about this sudden turn of events. I hope everyone appreciates what Frank is describing. Don't retire too soon, Terry, unless you are throwing in the towel. I urge you to keep your commitment and good faith with a great team. Let's think seriously about whether Michael's articulation in writing of such criminality is a message sent to us by either the devil or by God the Father. The fraud charges Cohn leveled against Voris hardened Bramer's position. Bramer now felt that he needed to issue an ultimatum, and in doing so, he may have overplayed his hand. Boris now felt doubly threatened. The fact that going quietly threatened to destroy his narcissistic fantasy of himself as the savior of the Catholic Church was bad enough. Now, with charges of fraud being leveled against him, Boris began to have second thoughts about his exit strategy. One day later, on Sunday, April 17th, Terry Carroll was still on board and ready to make one last effort to get Michael to see the consequences of not following the unanimous advice of his closest friends. Carroll wrote to Voris, endorsing Bramer's proposal, quote, I am deeply concerned about you, your work, and the church. You now have a past that I didn't and didn't need to know about. But now I do. And there are inevitable consequences to revelation of that past for you, your work, and the church. Your past is neither more nor less reprehensible than the past of some of our greatest saints, St. Francis, St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Augustine, for a very short list. And it's more important that a past be past than present. Everyone has a past. The problem here is that because of your past, which has been kept secret for all sorts of understandable reasons and never integrated into your story of your present, Revelation now threatens to destroy all your work and bring great harm to the church. You are at risk of suffering the fate of Father Benedict Groeschel, Father John Carapi, Father Thomas Utenauer, Father Francis Mary Stone, all shining stars at EWTN, and I don't want to see that happen to you. Mark has defined a way forward that offers you and your work a chance to survive. If you really care about your work and your people, you will let Mark do as he proposes and fix things properly. No, He will not do things exactly as you would or probably with the same people and emphasis as yours. But the work you have already done will have a chance to survive. I see no other scenario where that favorable outcome is possible other than the way that Mark has proposed. You cannot confess to the world that you have secrets that should have been acknowledged before this. You cannot continue along the path you outlined in your response to me and Mark because it does absolutely nothing to stop the oncoming scandal machine, but only possibly slows it down a bit and still allows it to hit you and the apostolate when it does. If you are not part of your apostolate, like St. Francis was not part of his later in life, then you can take one for the team and give them all a chance to survive and move forward. End quote. Carol then seconded Bramer's suggestion that any personal revelations should remain intramuros. Quote, If I were managing the events of this upcoming week, I would do no vortex, no news, no downloaded, no mic'd up whatsoever, effectively going dark for a week. I wouldn't even post any articles or commentary. 
let people wonder what's going on, and then the following week announce what will be done going forward and that there is a new board in place to repurpose and refocus the apostolate and allow you to address your declining health. That is what I would do. But as you know, I have all the business and PR savvy of a garden slug. Since Mark is copied on this, he can jump in as he wishes and be more detailed and practical. You have, you have to step aside totally and completely and without reservations. There really is no other way here. It is the unanimous recommendation of all whom you have trusted at least since I have known you. That has to mean something. I can see nothing but an apocalyptic outcome from any other scenario. I know your intentions are good. I know you care about your people, but God cares about all of this even more. There may have been a time in the last several years when your story could have been integrated into the history of the apostolate. You have been very open about your Augustinian past, but given the focus that much of your investigative reporting has taken, particularly over the past year, it's now not possible to achieve anything but discrediting all of it by confronting the scandal machine when it arrives at your door if you are still part of the ongoing story, end quote. At 7.30 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, April 17th, Boris's spiritual director called to inform him that Frank Cohn had gone through St. Michael Media's 990 forms and detected evidence of fraud. Boris was simultaneously the president of St. Michael's Media and the CEO of Concept, and was personally profiting from the transfer of tax-exempt contributions from St. Michael's Media to Concept. Boris's spiritual advisor was annoyed at the fraudulent misappropriation of St. Michael's Media money because the 37 young people who were working for Boris could have made a living with that money. Boris became very upset at the allegations, but eventually saw in them a way to fight back. He now began to portray his retirement as a hostile takeover, and an attempt to steal his life's work. As of 4.41 Sunday afternoon, his spiritual advisor was wary, saying, We have to tread softly. On the morning of Sunday, April 17th, Boris arrived at Assumption Grotto for Mass with an entourage. After Mass, the entourage moved to a restaurant in Ferndale for lunch. When Ryan Walker arrived with his two children, he asked if he could speak with Michael privately. During what looked like an extremely animated conversation with Walker, Boris admitted his gay past. He admitted that he was HIV positive, but denied that he was dying of AIDS. Boris told Walker that he was seeing a doctor regularly, that he was being treated for shingles, and that he had heart problems under control with medication. During the same conversation, Boris conceded that there were irregularities in the relationship between St. Michael's Media and Concept. Walker left at about, after about 45 minutes, but the situation had now changed. Boris had now found an enemy in Frank Cohn, and he could now portray Bramer's attempts to repurpose St. Michael's Media as an attempt to get his assets. When his spiritual advisor reminded him that he had agreed to go quietly and that some restitution was due to people like Bramer because you misrepresented yourself as a straight arrow guy, Boris flew into a rage and claimed that the devil was responsible for the mess he was in. At this point, the spiritual advisor interrupted Boris's narrative and unbraided him for falsely representing the situation. After reminding Boris that he was now dealing not with the intervention of the devil, but the effects of all the bad choices he had made thus far in his life, Boris became docile and calmed down. The crisis had passed at least for the moment. On Sunday, April 17th at 4.07 p.m., Bramer received a text from Ryan Walker informing him that Voris admitted to being HIV positive. Preparing to leave for San Francisco the following day, Bramer claimed that, quote, we have done all we can in a patient, caring, and Catholic manner to give Michael numerous chances at redemption and demanded that Voris, quote, tell the staff and subscribers, benefactors, and board members the true state of his homosexual past and full disclosure of the current state of his not-for-profit and for-profit business practices. He has 
till Friday. On April 17th, Mark Bramer wrote, Fellows, I fear he is now hardening and even less likely to do the right thing. But for the sake of so many innocent and worthy souls like poor Ryan Walker, it is now time for the end game. It is time for me to act. If tomorrow Voris doesn't tell the staff and subscribers, benefactors, and board members the true state of his homosexual past and full disclosure of the current state of his not-for-profit and for-profit business practices that donors gave under the assumption that their donations, subscriptions, are in good hands, donations that went directly to support CMTV after he separated the whole business relationship from Greenstar, Bramer's Corporation, to SMM Concept Productions, fraudulently, in my opinion, and Linda's, then I will tell them what I know to be the truth. Then everyone can decide what they want to do after knowing about all this, just like I have to do today. I will tell them, and the public, that I have decided that Voris needs to go away and I need to take over and shut this whole thing down for the good of everyone. I leave for San Francisco early tomorrow a.m. Carol was the first one to balk at Bramer's ultimatum. We are all agreed on the desired end, he wrote at 8.20 p.m. on April 17th. But I don't think Michael's public humiliation needs to be a part of that end. If he separates himself totally from SMM and CM then a new board can reconfigure things and do it right. If Michael will just accept stepping away, I think that will be enough. I don't agree with making his past known unless it serves some truly good purpose. I don't think he should quote-unquote come clean with staff. Legal improprieties can be discovered, addressed, and rectified if possible by the new management team. Michael will be sufficiently humiliated as it is. We don't need to insist on more. Bramer responded by telling Carol to stick to the original plan. He then fired off his ultimatum to Forrest. Quote, Michael, I have a proposal to make to you for a decision and execution no later than noon Eastern time tomorrow. An immediate decision would be ideal, and if you agree to the following, then I will drive immediately to Detroit with the SMM board resolution for execution by you, Mary, and Lisa. Resolution will be drafted to accept the resignation of you, three board members, to be replaced by me, Frank, and Terry, effective immediately. The new board will then make all decisions regarding the future of all the people and assets associated with CMTV. You have the assurances of the new board members that we will then negotiate a way forward to accommodate your financial needs as long as the surviving entity can provide such financial help to you. What say you? Do I come there today to bring the resolution for signature, or do you and the board members refuse this action? That evening of Sunday, April 17th, Boris discussed the situation with his father. Boris's spiritual advisor had feared his conversation ever since he had gotten wind of Michael's intention on Friday evening. The advisor wrote that we have to keep praying because Russ, Boris's father, is quite literally the source of the whole problem. Once again, he had to intervene and remind Voris he had agreed to retire and go quietly.